Hello. Hello. Um, so yeah, I think there's been a, quite a few things today that have kind of been confirmation, hopefully, of what I'm talking about today. So hopefully this is what God wants to say. So we're taking a bit of a break from our series in Colossians at the moment. We haven't finished it, have we? No, I, yeah, we're having a break over summer. Yeah, lovely. Thought so. I've been a bit out of it recently with the kids being ill, so I'm a bit like, what's going on? Um, but yeah, we're doing a, a, having a bit of a break, so we're just speaking on the things that are on our hearts at the moment. So I'm going to share a little bit about something I've been thinking about recently. Um, so a little while ago, I, I do a devotional, I've got a devotional app, um, and a reading in it really struck me. And it's from Psalm 77, from the New Living Translation. So I'll just read out verses 16 to 20 for you for context. When the Red Sea saw you, O God, its waters looked and trembled. The sea quaked to its very depth. The clouds poured down rain. The thunder rumbled in the sky. Your arrows of lightning flashed. Your thunder roared from the whirlwind. The lightning lit up the sky, lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your road led through the sea, your pathway through the mighty waters, a pathway no one knew was there. You led your people along that road like a flock of sheep with Moses and Aaron as their shepherds. So there's, there are different translations. Some of them talk about God's footsteps that couldn't be seen. There's different ways that it's phrased. But when I looked at the original, I think this does make sense, this um, New Living Translation. And I just really love the way it says it, that, that verse, your road led through the sea, your pathway through the mighty waters, a pathway no one knew was there. Um, and I just really like this image, that the, this idea that there was a path and no one else could see it, but there was a path there nevertheless, and God could see it. So the passage is talking about the path through the Red Sea that God made for the Israelites when they were fleeing from the Egyptians. Um, and, but this path, it, we know it well now, but it was a path that no one expected. It was impossible. It was mind-bending, but it was the path that God intended for them. And I love this idea, and I, I think it's relevant for us too, that God can do that for us too, that he can lead us along paths which no one else expects which seem impossible and which no one else can see. And yet there is a path because the creator God creates the path. because God makes a way. As it says in Romans chapter 11, verse 33, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Now, I read a different quote recently, and when I looked it up, it's actually by somebody who I quite respect. So I was like, oh, that's nice, because I thought it was just a meme on Facebook. <laughs> but um, the quote is by Soren Kierkegaard. I don't know if that's how you say it, but that's how I say it. And he said, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. So you only understand it when you're looking back on it, but that's not the order that you live it. You have to live it in, in the other order, in the correct order. So, And I think that when we look back at our lives, we can sometimes trace the path God was leading us on. But when you're in the midst of it, it may well have just seemed like a mess. And this was how, certainly how the Israelites would have felt about crossing the Red Sea. You know, later it seemed like a great idea. Later, it was one of the things that they talked about all the time and reminded themselves of how God had brought them through. But during and just before the experience, they probably felt quite differently about it. And the same, you know, the same would have been true of the disciples when Jesus died. In the midst of it, they would, it would have seemed impossible to keep going, to get through to anything meaningful. But afterwards, they saw that through it all, God had been making a way for all mankind. So I kind of went on a bit of a search through the Bible, looking at all the times it mentions roads and paths and ways. And they're mentioned so many times in the Bible. 
And the Bible it follows the literal journeys of some characters, you know, Moses and the Israelites. Um, you know, it follows the path of the exiles. And then, of course, there's Paul with his missionary journeys. But the Bible, I think, also presents to us the idea that our whole life is like one big journey and that there are paths for us to follow, ways that he has made for us, even though they may sometimes look quite unlikely. Psalm 84, um, verses 5 to 7 says, Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Now, I think I've mentioned these um, verses before when I've been leading. The context of the psalm is a celebration of when the people of Israel they used to go up to Jerusalem for religious rites and religious festivals. But I think it has something to say to us too, that we are a people whose hearts should be set on pilgrimage. You know, we're just sojourners in this world and we are on our way to the next. You know, we know that one day we will appear before God in Zion. We will stand before God. Uh, we know what our end will be. And this life, all it is, is us walking home. The English Standard Version actually says, instead of that first bit about set, our hearts set on pilgrimage, it says this, which I think is quite beautiful. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose hearts are the highways to Zion. I really like that. It's because I feel like it's like we have that in us. We, if we let the Holy Spirit guide us, we have the knowledge of those paths that we must travel. We know that way home. Now, people often say in life, don't they? It's not about the destination. It's about the journey. And obviously, the, God has things to say to us, things to do with us, ways to grow us um, over our journey. But I think that the, our destination is a big deal. If we don't have a destination, we're not really on a path. We're roaming at random, and we're just kind of passing the time. Our destination determines how our journey goes. But because we have a destination in mind, this means that our lives have purpose, and we should live according to that purpose each day, each step. Now, it's not, I know that this, we live in a busy world, and so this could come across to me being like, keep going for your ambitions, you know, and don't waste your time, blah, blah, blah. But actually, within that, those plans, those paths God has for you, that includes rest, that includes worship, that includes so many things. It's not, um, it's not always about moving forward in that way, although it is about getting closer and deeper to God. But we do that in so many ways that he leads us in. Yeah, um, and I, I, as I was reading more and more of the Bible, I thought it just all confirmed these things um, about us having this purpose. In Proverbs 12, chap, uh, verse 28, it says, in the way of the righteousness, there is life. Along that path is immortality. And you can just contrast that kind of um, verse with um, what comes up in Proverbs 5, verse 6. It's talking about the immoral woman. So she is someone, she's kind of a, a stereotype, a, a type, but a, someone who is not aiming to follow or honor God in their lives. And it's just, she's described like this. She gives no thought to the way of life. Her paths wander aimlessly, but she does not know it. So we are really shown that we have paths to follow. We have a purpose. Now, that um, immoral woman in Proverbs, she's kind of the exact opposite of Lady Wisdom, as they sometimes refer to her, who's also talked about in Proverbs. It talks a lot about wisdom. It talks about her as a woman. Um, I wonder why. Uh, sorry, that's, that's just me. <laughs> um, but Lady uh, of Lady Wisdom, the author of Proverbs writes um, in uh, yes, Proverbs 3, verse 17, her ways are pleasant ways. And all her paths are peace. And the Bible teaches us that those who are wise, they just they have a good way, a good manner of being. It's who they are 
And because of that, that means they would be following good paths. Now, I know that sometimes people, you know, we can all get a bit stressed about this. I'm, I'm talking about paths and I hope this is of encouragement for you, but sometimes we can be a bit like, am I on the right path? We can stress, you know, when you come to a crossroads, which is the right way to go? We can worry about those big decisions, um, you know, whether, worry whether we're missing out on a path that God's prepared for us. And I definitely remember um, wrestling with that a lot, probably uni days. And then when I was in Romania, trying to work out what was the right path for us, for me. But I recently, uh, I read a book called Inspired. It's, it's about the Bible. I really love this book. Um, and it has a part where it talks about wisdom. It talks about the wisdom books. And it talks about paths of life to do with wisdom. So I found it quite helpful. So I thought I'd just read out that little bit to you. Um, she says, the aim of wisdom literature, so the wisdom books, is to uncover something true about the nature of reality in a way that makes the reader or listener wiser. In the Bible, wisdom is rarely presented as a single decision, belief, or rule, but rather as a way or path that the sojourner must continually discern amid the, twi amid the twists and turns of life. I had a college professor who assigned the book of Proverbs to his Psychology 101 class, instructing us to circle in our Bibles every appearance of the word way or path. Their Bibles must have been covered and highlighted because it's mentioned so many times. The point, he said, is that wisdom isn't about sticking to a set of rules or hitting some imaginary bullseye representing God's will. Wisdom is a way of life, a journey of humility and faithfulness we take together one step at a time. To an anxious student who spent a, spend a lot of time worrying that her major or her homecoming date or her st student senate bid were outside of God's will, this lesson proved an enormous comfort. I think we want to, to make sure we don't miss the path of God, but I think if you're worrying about that, that probably means that you won't. If you are concerned about this, then you will be talking to God. Um, and I don't, I don't think we need to stress out too much about whether this is the right path or if that one. If we're following God's ways, he will lead us on the right path. And if we're lost, listening to God, he will let us know when we get off track. I have always found God much louder about the things that I'm doing wrong. Um, this path we are called to follow is not supposed to be like a rigid test. It's actually a reflection of our relationship with him. It's a sign that God is with us, that he's walking alongside us, that he's making a way for us in every circumstance, just like he was for the Israelites on their journey. Now, I will just refer back to that um, verse in Proverbs again, um, Proverbs 3, verse 17, her ways are pleasant ways and all her paths are peace. I do think it's beautiful. The Bible just has beautiful poetry in it as well. But I've been thinking a lot about peace recently. Um, and to be honest, I've not been going through a very peaceful time of late. Um, and sometimes when we have that, we can think, oh, maybe we're on the wrong track. Maybe we're on the wrong path. Maybe we've missed something. But I don't believe that walking along peaceful paths is necessarily anything to do with the circumstances you're walking through. In Psalm 23, we are told that because the Lord is our shepherd, we have all that we need. And he does definitely let us rest in green meadows. He encourages us to do that. And he does lead us beside peaceful streams. But he also guides us along right paths, bringing honor to his name. And these kinds of paths are often not easy paths. Just look at Jesus' path. Just look at the disciples' path. They weren't easy paths, but they brought honor to his name. And I think I've spoken about this before, that I don't believe that the part in Psalm 23, which says, even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. I don't believe that that's referring to you going off course. I don't think it's talking about somewhere you've gone accidentally or by mistake. 
It says when, not if, I walk through these places. Sometimes the right paths lead us straight through a valley, but God knows the way and he is with us. The reason I think that that verse says that all of wisdom's paths are peace is because wisdom brings peace with it. And the way in which all our paths can be characterized by peace is because we can bring peace with us. We have the Prince of Peace walking alongside us, and we have his wisdom to guide us, and we have his rod and his staff to comfort us in those times. It came to me as well when I was looking at all this, that in Ephesians 6, you know where it talks about the armor of God? It says that as shoes, we should put on the readiness that comes with the gospel of peace. And I believe that this is telling us that we are equipped with peace. We have access to this peace and that we are to walk out the peace which the gospel offers us. And this means that we are prepared to take peace with us wherever we go. Now, I know that this is easy to, to say. I re it reminded me of a conversation I had with Joe once. She said that she'd been to Uganda once and she had a time that wasn't as good, basically. And, and she felt like that she'd left. She, I remember she said, I left the path of peace. And, you know, if I'm looking back over um, the last few months, I've had some challenges and some of them, God told me it was going to be hard. And he keeps telling me it's going to be hard, but that I'm supposed to be there. So I'm walking through this valley, and but I know he's meant to be doing it. So that's what we're doing. Um, but then there's other things where I know I probably haven't dealt with them in the best way, you know, with the kids being ill. Obviously, I love the kids and I'm going to look after them. But three weeks of being stuck at home when I've got all manner of other things I'm supposed to be doing, I don't think I was being very peaceful that time. <laughs> that time. Um, so, but, but, as with all things, if you don't feel like you can cope, then you're on the right track because you're not supposed to cope on your own. You're supposed to ask God for help and he will give you that help. It's not that we're supposed to deal with these things. He walks us through them. He does them with us. He gives us that power. He, and what he, what I believe it's saying in, that, um, in um, Ephesians 6 is that we have access to that peace to walk it through. The gospel is the gospel of peace. Under all, we have peace because of what he's done for us. And that's what we can walk in. Now, at Spring Harvest, Terry Waite talked about how we can be co-creators with God. Terry Waite, who was in, um, I can't remember, what's the word? He was, yeah, he was kept hostage, yeah. He was in a hostage situation for about five years. And he had, um, yeah, he talked about how you are co we are co-creators with God that God is the creator, you know, he made all things and he makes a way for us, even if no one else can see it. But he also made us in his image, which means that we are made to create as well. And we can be a part of this process of making a way as we walk in the peace that the gospel has given us and play our part in bringing God's peace and good news into every area of our lives and into the lives of those around us we can help to create those new possibilities, those new options, those paths that nobody else thought were there. Again, it's not through our own strength, but it's in relationship with him and it's us reflecting our father. And as I was thinking about all this, I, I realized again that it's, it's very telling that Christianity was referred to as the way by the early Christians, as we read in Acts. You know, as I've said, words like path, highway, or way, track, all these words, they're used like almost interchangeably in a lot of the Bible. And there's an element that when God or Jesus' way is talked about, it's talking about, you know, their manner, their way of being. But I do think that that all still connects together because somebody's ways, their way of being, it determines the, their steps and it decides their path who you are is reflected in how you live. And Proverbs and Psalms, they go over this over and over again. They often talk about ways and paths being linked together. In Psalm 25, it says, show me your ways, Lord, teach me your paths, guide me in your truth and teach me 
for you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. And Proverbs 2 says, Thus you will walk in the ways of the good and keep to the paths of the righteous. For the upright will live in the land and the blameless will remain in it. And of course, then there's Proverbs 3, where it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. The way we are determines the way that we are going. And of course, the reason why the early believers called themselves the way and called Christianity the way was because that reflects the fact that Jesus claimed himself to be the way. We can know the right way to go in every circumstance, the right path to take, because we know him who is the way. So I believe that God has created and is creating paths for us to walk in. I believe that they'll go through some wonderful places and that they will take us to some really hard places, but that they can be paths of peace no matter what, because our walk is inspired by the gospel of peace because he has equipped us. I believe we are co-creators with God and sometimes we're going to walk along paths that make no sense to anyone else and sometimes don't make any sense to us either for stints of it. But because he we have him who is the way with us, then we can walk through those places on solid ground. So I'm going to finish by praying uh, as, as some verses over us. Um, it's adapted from Zechariah's song in Luke. I, I love what Zechariah says in, in Luke. Um, and he's praying it when, um, when John the Baptist, I can't remember if it's, before John the Baptist is born or after, but he's praying it and it's about what this means. Um, so I want to, I've adapted it slightly so it reflects our situation. Um, uh, but I just want to pray over us because it kind of reminds us that we're part of this one big story. It reminds us of what God and Jesus have done for us and how that affects our walk today. So yeah, I'll just finish with this prayer. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David. As he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant the oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And John was called a prophet of the Most High, for he went on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun has come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the paths of peace. Amen.